Hello, what's up? It's Gleb Alexandrov with yet another Blender tutorial for you. I've meant to do this video for a long time, but haven't got a chance to. But here we go! After watching this 30 minutes video tutorial, you'll learn how to make a cinematic bokeh effect for Blender, for cycles to be precise. We've been receiving a lot of questions from you guys and girls about this particular effect we've been using in our teasers for our stuff, so I'm thrilled I finally had the opportunity to bring this tutorial to life. Uh, so start watching and in approximately 30 minutes you'll learn ins and outs of the cinematic bokeh effect for Blender. First of all, we shall have a look at the Blender camera settings and how to adjust the depth of field. Feel free to get the project file that I'm gonna be using here by finding the link in the description below. Alright, so we have our camera here. We're gonna be applying the custom bokeh solution to this particular camera, so here we go. The viewport currently is churning out the ray traced frames, cause Cycles viewport rendering is on. You can click this icon to set it in motion. And obviously you have to also check that Cycles is our render engine currently. This effect that we are gonna be setting up requires ray tracing after all. By the way, the camera can also be found within the Camera01 collection in the outliner. Numpad 0 should get us straight into the view of this camera as if we are looking through a viewfinder on a virtual cinema camera or something. All camera settings can be located in this green menu with the camera icon. There's a bunch of useful settings there for sure, the focal length and so on. Though we won't need most of them cause we're gonna focus on the depth of field mostly. But first I want to enable the passport to check box in the viewport display settings and I'll increase it all the way to 1 to make the area outside the camera view black. Now it does look a bit like the viewfinder indeed. Uh, the one setting to rule them all in this video is gonna be the depth of field. Uh, the focus point can be set in two ways. What you can do is either tweak the distance to define the focus point in this way, the closer it is to the camera origin, the more shallow our depth of field becomes. It works like this. And uh, definitely it works like this in the real world optics as well. That, that is something that really excites me, that Cycles is definitely a physically plausible engine. Uh, there is a slightly more sure hit way of defining the focus point though. We can hit shift right click to land the 3D cursor somewhere, like on this sphere for example. I'll disable the overlays in the camera view by the way, as they are a bit distracting, you know. Uh, okay, so we just need an empty object that will serve as a focal point. Scaling it down a bit, so it's less distracting. Uh, I'm gonna call it focus. Now, going back to the camera settings, uh, we can just pick this empty object with the eyedropper tool, which can be found there. It is pretty hard to catch it. Basically, the prompt should say focus, but I'll cancel it and just pick it manually from the drop down menu instead. And now, uh, wherever we move this empty, the focus will follow. Nice, right? Let's give it a try swoosh and back again. We can see how the bokeh is changing depending on the distance. That's how we set up the depth of field, um, or rather the focus point. Now I'd, I would like to dive deeper uh, into the settings of the depth of field, which can be found uh, in the aperture menu. These are the most tasty bits for sure. The first value that you see here is the f-stop. It controls how much defocus do you want, or on the contrary, uh, how sharp do you want the image to be overall. The lower numbers give you more defocus. Like if we go really low, like 0.4, it will compress the depth of field so much that only a tiny sliver of depth will get into sharpness. Then we have the blade setting, which simulates the blades of an aperture. Uh, by using this setting, you can polygonize the bulky ball. Uh, let's say, let's give it five or whatever number of sides to make it look like a retro lens or something. Or we can round it up uh, by selecting the higher number of blades, or make it triangular. 
the funky triangle aperture, anyone? The rotation should spin these shapes in 2D space. Nothing spectacular, really. Alright, uh, so I'm gonna go back uh, to something like 12 blades for a nice rounded bulky circle. Lastly, the ratio slider is meant to simulate the anamorphic squeeze of the out-of-focus element. By default it goes from 1 to 2, 1 being the perfect circle and 2 stretching the out-of-focus elements uh, vertically. Uh, but let me pop out uh, to the viewport denoising tab really quickly to turn on denoising. I went with the optics denoiser, uh, because that's what works best for me. I own an NVIDIA card anyway. Alright, now it should be easier to see that increasing the anamorphic ratio stretches out all the out-of-focus elements vertically. This is usually referred to as the anamorphic compression. Even though the slider seems to be clamped at 2, it is possible to override it by typing in any number manually for a crazy compression effect. Like, try it out. Probably uh, you won't be using the values higher than 2 anytime soon, but anyway, it's fun to try. Uh, as a matter of fact, it can go below 1, but we don't need to get this crazy. Okay, as we are gonna be adjusting uh, the bulky circle shape, what size do we want these circles to be? I don't know, I find it easier to set up the custom bokeh with the circles that are neither too large nor too small. Like, um, the nice medium bulky, if that makes sense. I think I'll settle at uh, 0.7 for the f-stop, simulating a really fast, even impossibly fast lens with a wide open aperture and creamy bulky. Uh, I know for sure that certain cinematographers would sell their mothers into slavery to get their hands on such lens. Fair enough. Now on to the most interesting part, creating a custom bulky shape like it was shot on a peculiar vintage lens. Many old lenses like Helios 44 exhibit this kind of bokeh with unforgettable character. The things out of focus often look swirly, the bokeh has the cat's eyes effect to it, or onion rings or other extremely cool aberrations giving the unique aesthetic characteristics to it. I'll go for something like that uh, that will make the bokeh look uh, unique and cinematic. What I'll do is simply insert the cutout in front of our main camera. For that I'll go Shift A to add in a plane object first. Then uh, with that object still selected, I'll hold Shift and click on the camera to make it active. Then uh, Ctrl C for the copy attributes menu and copy its location first. You'll need the copy attributes add-on enabled for it to work. Similarly, Ctrl C and copy rotation as well. If you did it right, the plane should be placed at the origin point of our camera now, in perfect alignment. That is cool. Next, I'll just uh, displace it forward a little bit with G and Z twice to move it on the local Z axis. Move it on its front axis, in other words, like that. So the end of the camera sticks out a little bit. Can you see it? The pointy end of the camera empty object, like sticking out. But now, why don't this object block our camera? We don't see this object yet, because it got clipped by our camera clipping settings. To fix it, come over to the camera settings tab, click on the clip start and make it 0.001 something. Now, predictably, this plane just blocks the view of our camera and that is okay. It should be placed really close to the origin point, to our virtual sensor, let's say. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, to not press Z twice every time to slide our plane on its front axis, I'll click this menu and switch over to the local transform orientation. If you prefer to not use too many shortcuts, you can also open the left tool shelf with T, and then use the move gizmo. I mean, sucker for blender hotkeys though, so I'll be using my precious shortcuts with your permission. But you can use uh, anything you want, the gizmo is also fine. I'm also gonna scale this object down with the help of the S shortcut, like that. Okay, and finally I'll press T to close the left tool shelf. 
it's time to give our future cutout a name and new material too. This is our bokeh shape. So let's call it like that. Now in the materials tab over here, uh, I'll click new to create a new material and give it a name as well. Bokeh shape. All the magic will be happening in the shader editor, so it would be wise to have it opened. Objects, uh, use nodes, everything correct. Uh, we don't need this default shader, so X for delete. Now uh, Shift A to add a new node. And select shader, transparent shader. Now we just need to connect it like this to the surface input. The color in this shader works like this. White means absolutely transparent and black means absolutely opaque. Right? Uh, what we need to do now is give it a texture shaped like a star or a heart or something. I'm gonna press Shift A again to add in an image texture this time. And let's connect it right away to the color input. Uh, by default it shows magenta. It is the blender way of telling us, hey, the image is missing. So now I'll just head over to the folder with some cool bokeh shapes. Uh, by the way, this button switches the preview on. As you can see, we have a bunch of neat things here. Each representing a bokeh shape. From this more traditional circle to the heart-shaped cutout, which I love pun absolutely intended. Let's go with it actually. Uh, the screen turned dark because we need to adjust a few things. Don't worry, everything goes according to our plan. Now onto a slightly more complicated part of our workflow. Uh, so I want to give us a better preview of what's going on. So I'll go ahead and create one more window by clicking on the corner of the UI and dragging it to the left like that. It's gonna be our 3D view. So let's choose 3D viewport. Then uh, scrolling the top bar with the middle mouse wheel gets us to the rendering option. It should be the middle one, the preview. Okay, there is no texture seen just yet. It is a quick fix really, it's just that transparency preview hasn't been switched on in the viewport display settings. So let's head over there and uh, what do we need to do? We need to switch the blend mode to alpha blend to enable transparency in the viewport. The heart shape showed up. You can see that we essentially cut the heart shaped hole out of this plane by using transparency. Okay, we are still in the local orientation mode, so I'm going to displace it further away from the camera temporarily, so we just better see what is being adjusted. Something like that. Uh -huh. Now heading over to the transparent material that we have set up. We need to set a correct mapping now to be able to make this shape smaller, bigger or whatever. With the bokeh texture selected, Ctrl T should help us generate all the mapping nodes at once that we may need. But you have to make sure that the node wrangler add-on is turned on in the Blender preferences, otherwise it won't work. I'll go ahead and change the tiling mode uh, to clip, as I don't want this texture to repeat itself when we make it smaller. Okay, uh, now we just need to set the texture coordinate to object. And now it needs to be recentered somehow because it moved to the top right corner. As you can see. It can be done by offsetting the X and Y location by 0.5 in both. Nobody knows why, it just works. Just kidding. It can be seen really clearly possibly, but it should be perfectly centered now. Uh, lastly, we did all of that to be able to scale down the heart shape. Uh, you can hold shift for a finer control while scaling this thing down. Leaving some space around the hole just in case. And it seems that the basic setup for the cutout object is almost complete at this point. Really well done. We are almost there, now comes the most tedious part to make it look right. I'll move out the cutout back where it belongs, almost to the camera origin point. Like that. 
so the view gets progressively darker as this object blocks the incoming light. It is okay, let's head over to the shader editor and move these nodes to the right. Then shift A, converter, and insert the color ramp there. I'm gonna make the heart visible in the viewport. So we need to grab the right flag and slide it all the way to the left, essentially increasing the transparency of the cutout. We can fully compress it and then um, the entire heart will turn transparent or leave some air to get more transparency around the edges. It all depends on the look you're going for. Personally, I love the fringing or even the onion rings in my bokeh, so I'll definitely leave some edge there. Now the crucial part, press S to scale and gradually make it smaller until it clicks. I mean, until the bulky circles start turning whatever shape you have in your texture. Do you see that? It started to change and the whole thing gets slightly distorted as well. We'll get to it in a moment. That's an amazing stuff. A quick tip, uh, the closer this thing is to the origin of the camera, the sharper and crisper is the bulky shape. Let's try it out, actually. I'm moving it extremely close to the origin point of the camera, even closer, something like that, and scaling it further down. So if your bokeh circles don't turn into hearts, uh, play with the scale. It would be easier if we zoom into the brighter bokeh circles to see the change. Uh, Alright, these ones are perfect. We should have no problem seeing what's going on. Swoosh. Whoa, it's now hearts everywhere. Each out-of-focus point has effectively inherited the shape that we used in our texture. I think that is simply amazing. It is a bit dark though, compared to how it looked without that effect. Uh, that's because some portion of the light simply didn't get through. It got absorbed by uh, this new thing inserted in between the camera sensor and the light source. You can compare before and after by clicking on the eye icon in the outliner to turn this object essentially on and off. Yeah, see how dark it got. To help bring it back, we can adjust the color ramp. Within the white flag we have the light gradient. By default uh, it cannot be made brighter than white. But fortunately um, this can be overridden. Look, we have the value, which is currently uh, seems to be maxed out, but in fact it isn't. We can click it and type in anything, like uh, we can make it two times brighter or five times brighter perhaps. What I want to do is bring the levels roughly back to how it looked before adding the cutout. So this looks somewhat close, uh, let's compare it once again. Mm -hmm. Let's compare it. Now we are talking. Uh, it looks relatively close to the levels it had before. The size of the bulky elements looks a bit off to me as well. Smaller to be exact, so why don't we scale the plane up a touch? Perfect, just perfect. We are nailing everything. Like we mentioned before, you can play with the look and character of the bokeh by adjusting the levels in the color ramp node. Uh, right now you can see the uh, very pronounced edge. Look what would happen if we push the white flag till it almost crashes into the boundary. Uh, it should solidify the bokeh shape, kind of filling it in, resulting in a nice uh, simple readout of the heart shape for sure. Yeah. It's very hearty indeed. And it looks lovely. Puns everywhere. Alright, uh, dragging uh, this flag further away should give this thing an edgy look. That is essentially what we have had before. Uh, the tiny edge going on around it. Whatever you like more, I guess. Effectively, this is where your artistic sensibilities come into play. You may have your own sense of beauty when it comes to the look of the out-of-focus uh, elements. Chances are you might have a certain vintage lens in mind even. Uh, who knows? Take your time, it's so fun to play with this effect. 
I wanted to mention what would happen if you change the aperture of the f-stop value in the camera settings with the bokeh setup in place. Uh, basically, what would happen is that the bokeh circle size will change uh, too, obviously, and our cutout as a result won't work as flawlessly anymore. That is unfortunate. Uh, I think what I want to say is that the cutout size should be adjusted for the aperture value. If the bokeh circle gets smaller, then the plane needs to shrink as well. If you still want to have that shape to shine through, that is. That is kind of important to keep in mind. Uh, you may accidentally change the f-stop value. Uh, just know that you have to adjust the cutout shape. Alright, I have just reset the f-stop value back to 0 0.7 and now a few words about these settings again. It all works fine with the custom shape, uh, I mean the blades, the rotation, the anamorphic ratio. You can still define how many blades you want to see and the shape will get slightly more angular. The anamorphic ratio can be tweaked too, of course. Uh, that'll blend in a bit of an anamorphic lens character into it, uh, but also distort the shape. So, I would go with something less aggressive, uh, but with a tiny bit of anamorphic character to it, something like 1.3. Just a little bit of squeeze. That's it for the camera settings and their synergy with the setup we have built. Not everything boils down to the shape of the individual bokeh units, the circles though. The amazing effect that cutouts have on the optics as a system is that it casts kind of a distortion field on the entire frame, like in these photos that we had a look at before. It was shot with the M42 vintage lenses, something like Helios. Uh, the entire visual field is set in motion, as you can see. Recently I've discovered that this effect is also uh, possible to replicate in cycles with ray tracing. In fact, it's almost too easy to do that. Well, in some basic form, I guess. Before actually making it happen, let's swap the texture just to shake things up. Feel free to use any of these images in any kind of projects. I created it myself anyway. Um, so, okay, I'll go with this shape. It's quite an interesting effect already, but I'll adjust the color ramp to get some of the onion rings back, or simply the crispy edges back. Du -du -du -du. It looks good, uh, but actually uh, I want to try a more neutral one, which is closer to the default circle. It will be easier to see the distortion field this way. Okay, as we remember for sure, currently the cutout is placed extremely close to the camera origin point, making it show a perfect uh, custom bokeh shape with no crazy distortions around the frame and stuff like that, clear from edge to edge, basically. That is exactly what happens if we place it so close to the center, or to the origin point, forgive me. But look at that. Actually, we can place it really, really almost overlapping with this point, for the perfect rendition of uh, bokeh shapes, whatever it is. But if you want to add the distortion effects into the mix though, all you have to do is just slide this plane further away from the camera and uh, making it larger. See that sort of perspective breathing as I move it back and forth? It is amazing. Now I'll just um, scale up the plane so it covers the full frame and we are good to go. Basically here's how we can recreate the vintage looking depth of field in Blender. Uh, as for me, that is quite a mind-blowing fact about Blender. If you move it even further away, the effect will become even more wild, uh, with, uh, I don't know, the gravitational lensing almost. Welcome to Space VFX, essentially. Here we made the Event Horizon Blender scene. Could be a donut spinning in there too, somewhere. Crazy stuff. But you got the point. For me, personally, I, I would keep it a bit less jarring. Uh, but still vintage looking and distorted. I think it adds a lot of character to otherwise a fairly CG looking shot. It won't fit all the genres and styles of course, as it's still a fairly strong aesthetic choice. But anyway, another cool thing about it is that on changing the focal point, you'll see the focus breathing. The whole frame will uh, be kind of stretching in some way on shifting the focus. 
which you may or may not like actually, it's interesting though. To sum it up, this lensing or distortion is a part of what makes this custom bokeh technique in Blender and in the real world photography so enticing. Brilliant! Running the risk of boring you, my dear viewer, to death, I cannot help but show one more technique that is coming from the world of cameras and lenses, let's say. There is one switch in the camera settings that also changes the way the perspective is rendered. That is the camera type. Currently, it's a normal 35mm camera with a non fisheye lens. In cycles, it is possible to change the lens type to panoramic, though. And then, for example, uh, to fisheye equisolid. We had 35mm before, let's type in a 35 again to make sure that the focal length lines up very nicely. Look how the barrel distortion near the edges really kicked in, showing it's a fisheye lens construction indeed. So you can see how the perspective gets compressed in a way, uh, an extra distortion applied. We even start to see the edges of the background plane, which shouldn't be legal, but we do it anyway. One more option that is way more terrifying though, just look at its name, is the fisheye lens polynomial. The settings are no less spooky, five distortion coefficients or something, running from K0 to K4. Each of these Ks command a different distortion field, K0 sucking us back into the space VFX learning material, presumably. Think about it, maybe we plunged through the event horizon a few minutes ago. Anyway, anyway, by adjusting these fields, we can complement. Uh, I mean, we can complement the distortion we created uh, with our custom bokeh setup, like a pincushion distortion on top of it. Maybe we can simulate an old Soviet lens from an alternative timeline, Jupiter 10, let's say, which was famous for its alien vision effect, or whatever lens you would model using these settings even the one that cannot possibly exist. Oh gosh, here we go again, a black hole. I don't know, I, I won't go with you there though. Leave me here, I'll stay with my moderately distorted custom bokeh, because that is a little bit too much even for my taste. But anyway, I thought I would share it with you, and potentially it could be a, a really interesting way of approximating the lenses that cannot exist, but do exist in your artistic imagination. Alright, that's a wrap, everyone. It's Gleb Alexandrov, once again for creativeshrimp.com, and I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial for creating cinematic bulky effects in Blender. Throughout this tutorial, we have delved into the process of designing a custom bulky effect and utilizing it to up our cinematography game in Blender. I'm thrilled that I finally had the opportunity to bring this tutorial to life, and I believe it will elevate your 3D rendering skills. Before you go, don't forget to click like, subscribe, and leave a comment. If you have any suggestions for the future content, I would love to hear your ideas. Thanks for watching, and until next time, drink more coffee, and we will change the world of computer graphics. Like that.